kids are going to get like double treat here. You're going to get the double double duty. All right. So back to the beginning. What we're going to do is we're going to be talking about the utilities and the, and the reports options today. All right. So the first thing that we're going to do is I just want to make sure we're recording. We are. And we're going to go to the utilities menu. And we have under the utilities menu, we have the account mapping option, which we talked about yesterday. I'll just kind of pull it up so everybody can see it again. I'm sorry we're re re repeating this, but um, this basically allows you to map old accounts, benefit accounts, or not old, original accounts that employees would have been charged to, to new accounts that you want them to be charged to when you're processing distributions. So, this is the option where right now we have some accounts that are set up out there and currently these accounts are set up based on what you know previously maybe we had to add a mapping account we can actually add more mapping accounts by clicking on the plus button and then it brings up a, a, a box at the bottom of the screen um, that's blank where we can put in the original account that we want to take and charge to the new account that we want to map it to we save that and then, like we talked about yesterday, we have the capability of reordering or moving these accounts around just basically by clicking and dra dragging the account where we want it to be. And then when you click save, it'll save that change that you've made. Or if you added a new account, it saves that information. Our next option on new utilities is that attendance absence import, which again, we spoke about that yesterday because it kind of uh, follows along in the payroll processing portion. And so what this is used for is just like a classic, we have the US import option, USB import option, which you take a, a file from kiosk or a file from ASAP in the correct format, and you actually load that into the attendance or the absence, the attendance screen classic, the attendance screen here in the redesign. Um, and we spoke about that yesterday, so we're not going to revisit it all. I just kind of want to pull up the screen to refresh your memories. Then we have the automatic payment reconciliation, which Andrea spoke about that earlier, one which she did the, uh, the processing portion, because the auto reconcile option is right in that processing portion. So we kind of had to gel those two together. So that's already been talked about this morning. We have the change password option, which basically, if I'm the employee, I'm, I'm logged into my system, I could go in here and you can see that my username is already uh, defined on the screen. I could go in and put in my old password and then create a new password and verify that new password in these two boxes. And then once I do that, I just click the change password option and my password is saved. So I can, you know, log in the next time with my new password. We'll go back to utilities. Um, our next feature is the file archive option. And the file archive option is basically, there's three tabs. You'll see we've got a payroll archive, we've got a pay form archive, and a W2 archive. Um, we won't talk a lot about the payroll, the pay form and pay, W2 archive, importing options, we will talk about these features, but there's other options that go with this that we're not gonna discuss. That's more of a complex process. And so that's more of an intermediate training option, but we will talk about these three tabs. Um, the, the payroll archive option is basically, it's just like your payroll CV in Classic. It's going to be pulling in or should have all of the reports that basically are processed when you're processing a payroll when you're running ODJFS, when you're running your retirement uh, reports, when you're creating your ACH submission file for the bank for each payroll. So what I'm gonna do is we'll go ahead and we'll go in and, and pull up the payroll payment detail, which would be uh, basically from the payroll that I processed yesterday, I used that 320 date. So we should go out here, we should be able to see the report that were created when I was processing the payroll. We should be able to see that. Hold on, I clicked on the wrong thing. Uh, I'm sorry, the per pay. I clicked on, I said the wrong thing, I clicked on the wrong thing. This is the, the per pay reports, which are the reports that got processed when I was doing the payroll. 
forgive me for that, that incorrect wording there. But you can see there's all reports from every payroll that has been processed in my system. You can see the dates and basically the timestamp is when they were pulled out here. You can see the description. That's what actually, when we actually processed the payroll yesterday, I put in, um, I think it was March 20th or whatever for my pay date. I'll be able to see that here. So you can pull up the description, how it is, or if you want to filter it, maybe we want the most current payroll at the beginning. So I'm going to go ahead and click on description a couple times. And then when I do that, it filters it. So it pulls up my last payroll that I processed, which was for March 20th. You can see all of those reports sitting out here from the pay that I did yesterday. So if I wanted to, let's just say, look at that, uh, the pay report, I could just click this download option. And when I do that, it's going to ask me where I want to download it to, just kind of like the reports did yesterday when we were creating them. So I'm going to go ahead and click save because I want to actually just pull this report up so I can take a look at it. So I can actually go in and see by report from yesterday, my pay report that I processed. And again, all of those reports that were processed yesterday during the payroll are, should be out there, should be located out there under the per pay. And then we're going to talk about how these reports get out there in a little bit, but for right now, I just wanted to show you the file archive itself. We have a, uh, the, you can see we've got the view or the little eye option for each report that's out here. And basically that's just like a, it's just like showing us the, the setup of the report. If for some reason I needed to change something on here, I could do that if I wanted to. I could change the, um, you know, the file name or whatever. I could make all those changes. Anything that's not grayed out, I can make a change to. More than likely, you're probably not going to want to, but there could be some reason that maybe you want to make a change. So that option is available. And then we do have a modify option as well. So if we're in if we're in view and we hit edit, we can modify, but we can also just do the same thing if we hit the modify tab. Again, anything grayed out, we can't change. Anything not grayed out, we could change. And then the last option, of course, is the, the delete option. Uh, I probably don't want to delete anything out of here, but if I did, I could delete a report out of here if I chose to do so. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and exit out there. And then you'll see also we have other reports, like we have this ACH submission option. So if I go in here and click on this, excuse me, on the view option, again, it shows me anything that was processed. This was all for March 12th. Um, my, my ACH files from yesterday aren't out there. I'm pretty sure I created one. Um, so I'm not quite sure why they're not there, but they should be. And like I said, every report that you have that you process during a payroll or any other, other report process should be located out here. Um, you'll notice one thing that's not here. Um, let me look at this one here. The payroll payments, that's your, that would be like your checks and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, your payroll payments like checks and things, direct deposits, email direct deposits. If you process those, that information should be out here. Then we have ODGFS reporting, uh, the benefit accrual. So if you process the benefit accrual option, you should see that information out here. Actually, I did do that yesterday. You can see my, my information out here because the timestamp is from yesterday's date. And I use that 315 accrual date. So that information is out here under, under the uh, file archive. All of that is under the per pay information. Now, one thing that you do not see, and this is something that I'm actually going to talk about at our sprint meeting today, because when I was out here last night looking, I'm like, my outstanding payables are not out there, which basically is my everything I paid yesterday for my deductions. Those reports are not out here and they should be. 
they should be included out here like everything else. Um, so I had to talk to the programmers today at our sprint meeting and find out why they are not out here. Um, another thing that we have is the employer distribution. So you could go into that and you can actually see any employer distributions that were processed yesterday. Right here, we've got two of them that were processed yesterday. I, I think I did like a Medicare and maybe like a retirement. I could go in and actually look at those then and see actually what I processed. If I go ahead and look at that, it should give me all the information that I processed for the employer distribution. Actually, I think one of them was the report and the other one might be the actual employer distribution report that gets processed out there. Those are the reports, I'm sorry. That's not for the employer distribution screen. These are from the reports that we processed yesterday. <clears throat> okay, let me go back here. I can get back. Come on. What's going on here? Ah. Hold on. I think I'm stuck. Hold on. Yeah, hold on. I'm spinning. Okay, there we go. Now it's, <laughs> it's not doing what I want it to do, but okay. Yeah, hold on here. There we go. That's what I wanted to see. All right. So, can you still hear me? Hold on, just be like this. All right. Ready? Can you still hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you, Lori. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate it. I think You're I welcome. Some disconnected here. Let me look and see what's going on. Now, can you? Can everybody see my screen again? I am so sorry. I don't know what's going on here. Let me get rid of this thing here, too. Hey, Brian, can you see my screen? Yep, I'm good on this end. Okay, perfect. I just want to verify that everybody can see my screen. Sure. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. So let's go back. We'll go back to the uh, utilities file archive option. And we're going to talk about, now we're going to talk about the pay form archive. So if you have uh, pay, uh, pay form information that is used, like when you're processing uh, pay, distrib pay distributions, I'm so sorry, my mind went blank. That information will be, be processed out here as well. You can see I don't have anything out here. And then we also have the W2 archive. Now, anything that was processed, like if you have dis districts that are currently live on the redesign and they process W2s through, you know, they process the submission file through the redesign, they would have data out here already for the, the current year. But anything as far as like any uh, prior years that was uh, out there probably there is probably out in your payroll cd all of that information would have to be basically imported into the w2 archive file in the in in the w2 area and again we're not going to talk about file importing today because that's a whole other session which is more of the uh, intermediate session but i wanted to show you the file archive basically to show you where all of the reports are now going because that's the equivalent of the payroll CD from Classic. All right, we'll go back to utilities. Um, our next option is the job scheduler. Uh, now, yesterday, we kind of looked at the job scheduler a little bit because I was showing you when I uh, processed the email direct deposit, I actually went out there and showed you that that job was sitting out there waiting to process. So. When I clicked that job scheduler, it actually pulled up and it showed me my job sitting there waiting to process at two o'clock in the morning, just like I had set it up. Hold on. I don't know what is going on. Things are popping up on my screen here. 
Okay. Yeah, I'll just let that go. Uh, let's see. There we go. Okay. Finally, there's the job scheduler. Okay. So we've got the job scheduler. Hold up. Let me, I keep trying to minimize this. I cannot get, there we go. So the job scheduler, again, basically lists any reports that are sitting out there that you could process or that have processed. So what happens is, Yesterday, when I actually processed the payroll, those all those jobs that we just saw out in the, in the file archive, those actually showed up on this job scheduler as of like last night. I could see them all sitting out there and they were complete. So basically what that means is every pretty much everything that you process that goes out to the file archive, you should see out here in the job scheduler. And as I said earlier, I talked about those outstanding payables that I processed yesterday. But when I looked out at the job scheduler last night, I did not see anything as far as my outstanding payables. So again, that's an issue I'm gonna discuss at our sprint meeting. But overall, if you have a district that's processing a payroll and they actually uh, process like, we call it like the, the trigger or the firing option, that basically fire, fires the reports or triggers the reports to run, to go out to the payroll archive file, you should see those sitting out here in the job scheduler. So a lot of times, if someone, if you create a ticket and you send it to us and you say, hey, uh, we're out in the file archive, but we're not seeing this report, we might tell you, go look at the job scheduler, see if it actually completed, see if it's there. And like I said, when I looked yesterday or last night, my anything that I did without saying payables wasn't there. So I got to figure out why that is happening. It could just be because it's, this is a test account too. And there might be something wacky with it. But these file, this job scheduler is really, really nice because you can, you can see anything that process completed. Um, like I said, I had those, uh, the submission, the ACH submission file which that went out to the archive. You can see that right here. You can see that information and it completed the status. So there's a lot of things that you can look for when a report is processed or you've got a report set to process. This is where you can go and look and see, hey, it's going to process, it's going to, it's going to run at this time of day because I've got it set up to run that time. So this is a good option for you to look at. And again, if the district calls you and asks you a question about a report not showing up or this or that, you can go out to the job schedule and see, hey, it, de it never ran, it never processed it. So that's a good good way to, to look and find it. Um, our next option under utilities is the mass load option. And the mass load option in the redesign is similar to the USC load in Classic. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk. Um, I, I know Mark, who is our supervisor, he has actually talked about they may try to just do like a whole reformatting of this mass loading option to make it a little more, I want to say convenient or easier because it seems like right now it's kind of uh, a little bit complicated, a little bit complex. And so they're going to maybe eventually get that so it's a little bit uh, more user friendly. But for right now, it is an option that can be used. And what happens is you would go out like to utilities, use that mass loading feature. If it's turned on, like Andrea showed you earlier, you could go out and you have to choose your file. You have to have a CSV file. You actually, you're going to actually load into a particular field, like into a screen, maybe uh, an employee record or a payroll item record. What you can do is let me go out. I've got a uh, I've got a mass load file that I set up yesterday for the test. We're just going to use that. Okay. So what this is this mass load file that I'm going to use is where are you? Hold on, I got to find it here. Here it is. It's it's going to go to the adjustment journal. 
Um, actually, I'll show you what the file looks like first so you can see it. Let me pull it up real quick. And then that'll make a little more sense when we actually do the mass load itself. Maybe. All right. Um, here we go. Let me just pull over this is the CSV file that I created so you can see what we're going to be loading. Okay, so it's going to pull up here. This is going to be what we're going to be loading. And like I said, we're going to actually load data into the adjustment file, the adjustment journal, which can be done. So let's just say that you have some corrections that need to be made to an employee. Maybe they're federal tax, like their uh, uh, their fringe benefit field, the total gross, taxable gross. Those fields could all be updated. And you'll see here, I'm updating more than just the federal record. I'm going to be updating the federal record for the fringe benefit, but I'm going to be loading up the fringe benefit. But you can see, I'm also updating the Medicare, the city tax, and the city, uh, both, I'm sorry, Medicare and city tax records. The reason being, because when you add a fringe benefit manually in the system, it doesn't process that on for Medicare or city tax records. So what I'm gonna do is adjust it on the screen so it does it automatically on the, on the total gross and the applicable gross. So those, those are actually updated. Oops, hold on. So you can see like my setup of my CSV file, how I have it set up, I have the employee information as far as the employee number, employee last name, first name, the, the type of that I'm going to be making the adjustment to in the adjustment journal. And then I'm using the transaction data 312 and then the dollar amount of the fringe benefit as well as why I want to increase the total and um, applicable growth to, or with, I should say, $100. And then I have to include the payroll item code and the payroll item type as well. So I'm going to go ahead and I just want to format this cell just in case. I think it'll pull in with just a single digit, but I want to make sure I have the three alpha characters in there just in case. I want four, I want three. Okay, so I'm going to save that. And then I'm going to go ahead and use that mass import option. So let's just get out of there. All right, so I've already got my file pulled in. Like I said, I chose my file. Then here I have all the importable entities. So any place that I can actually mass load a file right now. So here are all of the options. And again, there's several. Where in classic, you, there were not that many. I mean, you had, basically you had your at your attendance screen, your employee record, your uh, payroll items. Here you have a lot of different choices. You have um, vacation, your leave, everything. You have all these different features, all these different options. So again, I'm going to be going to that adjustment journal because that's where I want to import or mass load that information that I just showed you on that CSV file. So what I'm going to do, I've got the file chosen and I've got my entity chosen where I want to load it. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click the load feature. And when I do that, it's going to give me a, a USB load error report, just like Classic gave you a report. And it's going to tell me how many records could be loaded and how many errors there were. So if I wanted to go look at that USB load error report, it should be pretty much empty because basically, let's pull on what can I have screen? Let me slide it over here so you can see it. So basically it's telling me there weren't any errors, everything loaded correctly. So that's a good sign. So if I wanted to verify and say, I don't I want to make sure, you know, I really want to make sure that this truly loaded. I can go into the adjustment screen. And then I should be able to pull up the employee. I think I used Corey Todd. He's my go-to. And you can see 
here are all of the things that actually loaded when I loaded that spreadsheet using the, um, I shouldn't say that, I should say, this is everything that loaded. This one here didn't, but then you can see my transaction date. And if I wanted to, I could just filter it and only show, and only pull up what I actually loaded today, just a few minutes ago. And I could, if I wanted to, if I really wanted to get crazy, I could run a report and it would show me all the information that's on the screen. Any questions so far on everything that we talked about under utilities? Um, hold on, I gotta go down here. Okay, nope, I don't think I have any questions. Perfect. Okay, um, our next option under utilities is the show profile. And all this is, is really it just shows the profile of the user that has uh, is logged in. So basically, my username is admin, my organization that gives me that information, and then it also shows me what rules I have assigned to myself. Uh, not a lot of information. There's no editing or you know deleting or anything. It's just kind of showing you what what information you pertains to your user. The last option we have under utilities is the tax estimator. Now the tax estimator is the tax tab that was in classic. We had a lot of people that were asking for it and totally understandable because everybody wants to be able to, you know, go in and say, well, if I change my um, my exemptions or my my exemptions from zero to one or zero to two, what's my federal tax or what's my state tax going to be compared to what it is now? So you can go into this tax estimator and it's really, really nice because um, I think I'm going to say it's really, really nice. And even though it's really, really nice, I think we do have a couple little things that um, need to be tweaked. And I'm going to tell you about that when we get into the screen. So I'm just going to go ahead and pull up an employee. And actually, this employee was somebody that got paid yesterday. Actually, before we do that, let's go look at her in on the dashboard. Because we want to look at her, her pay or him. I don't know, these test files, I have a male name and a female middle name. So I'm not sure exactly what's going on with that. We'll call it him, her for right now. <laughs> okay, so here's my pay from yesterday. So I'm gonna pull that up. I kind of wanna, I just kind of wanna look at it because I wanna compare when we do the tax estimator. I wanna look and make sure, is this truly pulling in what it, what it was withheld yesterday? So we can see here, we'll look at the total uh, amount paid. It was 24.30.12, okay? And then we're gonna look at the payroll items. What was withheld? All right, so let's go to the federal. We can see 171.60 was withheld. But you can see she, all, he, she, whatever he is, also has an additional amount withheld of $20. And then their state tax was 52.93. City was 3532, and then they had school districts as well, which was 2518. Then you can see all the annuities, because annuities play a factor in the tax. It used to be a tax tab as well as tax, the tax estimator now. So the annuities, if you look at all of these and total everything up, because that includes the SRS annuity, if you total everything up, I think it comes up to about Oh, uh, what was it? Four hundred fifteen dollars and eighty-three cents, I believe. So let's go back to the tax estimator under the utilities option. Now we're going to pull uh, our employee back up. All right. So what we can do is we need to pull in the job, you know, that the employee would be getting paid on. Well, I want to kind of compare it to what she was paid on yesterday. So I know she was only paid on job one. So I'm going to only pull in job one. All right. So then if I go down here and click on this fill data option, what that does, you can see this used 2020 W4 
that was actually populated before I put the full data option, but she must not be using the new W4. She's using the old format, the old thing, the old way things were. So it actually looks at that federal record and says, oh, hey, she's not using a w, new W4. We're going to use uncheck that box. So it did. You can see that. Um, if I go in here now, I can see that the pay plan is by weekly, which it is. But when I did the fill data, it actually pulled in everything that's on that federal record as far as the marital status, her, ex him, her exemption, that additional withholding, which was the $20. And then it gives me the tax rate for the school district tax. And then they don't have any additional withholding for Ohio as well as no exemptions. And then I can see that the gross pay, the last gross pay, it shows 24312, which is exactly right. That's what we saw on the dashboard. And the annuity is 41583. That's exactly what we saw on the dashboard. So from the 320 pay, we can truly see this is what she was paid, this is what the annuity is for. Now, if I go in and click calculate, because I'm going to actually click calculate, I want to see truly what she and what was withheld. On, on that pay with it being set up like this. And these are exactly the right figures. Now, the federal, you'll notice, is 191.60. Well, we saw it was 171.60 on the dashboard, but remember, she had the $20 additional withholding, so that totals 191.60. The Ohio was 52.93, and the school district was 25.18. So at this point, this is showing me everything that actually happened. Oh, hold on. Everything that actually happened yesterday. All right. But she came in, she said, Well, if I change my exemption on my federal record and state record, if I change my exemption to one, for my federal and to one for my state, and if I I've done that. You can see these figures down here didn't change, okay? If I click the calculate option, you're going to see a new column with the new calculations for what I, she just asked me. Okay, so if I change it to one and one, exemption one federal, exemption one state, what are my taxes going to look like if I do that, okay? Now, here is where I was talking about earlier that we're talking, we think that maybe some, um, a couple little tweaks need to be made because I'm going to show you next what I'm talking about. What happens is we're thinking, maybe I can get you guys' opinions on this, and then I think they're even talking about maybe taking it to the, uh, the prioritization committee, but what we're thinking is right here is the oldest hold, right? Here's what we calculated with the one and one. But what's going to happen when I go up and change this, let's say the two and two, it's going to take this information and put it in the old withheld and put the new stuff in the current. The, this here, the original is going to be gone. And we're thinking it might not be a bad idea to keep that, that old as a static field, basically let that stay out there and then just add a new column over here with the new if I use two and two. So we're, that's kind of overthinking. So we might, you know, if you guys want to give us your feedback on that, I'm going to go in here now and I'm changing this to two and two. But you'll watch this down here when I hit calculate. See how it pulled my one and one over to the old withheld. And now the current is what it's going to be if I do the two and two. Um, I think, yeah, like we have a couple of things, a couple of things, a couple of people that are totally green. They need, they say the old needs to stay. Uh, and then the current, I mean, my thinking is keep the old, but then if, if you change it three or four times, have those just keep popping up in new columns each time to show what, you know, if they change to two and two, or if they change it to two and three, because if I change it to three, what's going to happen here? is what's in the old now is going to be replaced with this. 
so wide. So I'm going to call it calculate, and I moved it over. So I think that we need to keep those kind of static. So, but that's one thing. At least we have the tax estimator out there, so it'll help districts. You know, what their employees that come in and say, "Well, I want to know if I change this. What's it going to be? What are my taxes going to be?" This is huge. It's very nice that, we, that it's out there. Uh, the programmers did a great job getting it out there, and and the way they got it set up, it's working really, really well. And I, like I said, we have some tweaks that um, we need to fix, but I think, actually, I've had several responses on the chat saying, uh, we have to keep the old as the static field. Totally agree, totally agree. So we may even discuss that today at the um, sprint meeting. So we'll probably bring that up. And like I said, they may have to run that through prioritization. Um, we'll just find out what they say. But that is our tax estimator that's out there. And I think for now, it's, it's at least it's usable and, and districts can use it. So it is something that will give them data if they, if they you know, want to use it, which is really good. Okay, does anybody have any questions on the utilities options that we have out there? Okay, no questions on utilities. We're going to go right into the reports options. Um, we've had Fridays with fiscal, and we've kind of talked about reports uh, bundles. But we're going to kind of talk about them a little bit today again as well, in case we have new users. But this is kind of like focusing towards beginners, or if we have users that have been using it and just kind of want to refresh or talk about it, we have a report bundle feature. Now, um, you'll notice I went to reports and I clicked on report, report bundle. It brings up this report bundle manager screen. Now, kind of going to flow back to what we talked about the file archive. You can see all of these different report bundles sitting out here. All of these report bundles, you'll notice you can't make any changes. You can view them, but you can't change them. What that means is all of these are set up to go out to the file archive. And all of them have triggers. Basically, there's something that gets processed that triggers the reports that are in the bundle to go out to the file archive. So let's go to, let's do the payroll posted report archive. So if I click the view, the little, the little eyeball, if I just click the view option, I can see that report bundle. I can see down here all the reports that are getting created in that report bundle. Okay, so like when that report bundle processes, the payroll report, the budget distribution report, the payroll account distribution report, the pay amount summary report. Let me see if there's anything else in there. I don't want to let me go down. And the payroll item detail report are all in that bundle. Now, you can see up here what event triggers that bundle to take place. The event that triggers it is when the payroll post is completed. So when, you, when I post the payroll yesterday, it actually triggered all of those reports to go out to the per pay report uh, directory out in the file archive. <clears throat> Now, there's another option out here as well. Like I said, all of these are set up. You can't really do anything with them. The only thing you can do with them is if for some reason you wanted to turn one of them off. To do that, you can see here, right now, all this report uh, bundle is enabled, basically meaning when, at, when the trigger event happens, they're going to go out to the file archive. If I wanted to turn one off, I do have a capability of doing that simply by unchecking it. And then what's going to happen is when that trigger event happens, that report, those reports aren't going to go out to the, the file archive. And that was the first thing I checked when I was looking for my, uh, my, um, my payables that actually I posted yesterday. I wanted to make sure that that was enabled. And it is. It's enabled, but it, they just never went out there. So that's an option that's, that's available. Like I said, these are all predetermined, pre-set up by one of our programmers. So those are all out there. Now, if for some reason you wanted to create a bundle 
and have it go out to the file archive, you could do that. And the way you can do that is, let me go here, got to pull up mine. Oops, got to click the create option. And when you do that, you can go ahead and give it a report bundle name. So I'm going to call this audit because I'm going to run basically the audit report. We'll say every time I post the payroll. Let's just say that we do it then. And now I can put a description of audit report if I wanted to put a tag on it. I could do that. And then what I need to do is select the report that I want to add to the bundle. So I want that audit trail report to be the one that actually gets triggered when I actually process or post the payroll. So I'm putting that report out there. And then to add that report to the report option in the bundle, I have to click the plus button to move it to the reports current in the bundle. Now, if I want to modify this, I can do that, that report, just by clicking on that modify option. And then maybe I want to set up my query. How do I want, what do I want it to run for? Well, the auto report, we definitely want a start and end date right now because the auto report, if there's no beginning and ending date, that it takes literally forever. And sometimes it won't even complete. But if I set it maybe for just a month, so if I'm processing payroll in the month of March, every time I process payroll, I want that auto report to trigger. I could just set the start date as the M and the end date as the H. That is an actual shortcut. We actually have a list of shortcuts listed out in the documentation that you can actually see and view, like we have month, quarter, fiscal year, um, all those options are, are visible out there and it gives you what what you need to put in the starting date, ending date. But like I said, since this auto report is not tweaked like we want it, I'm hoping between June and August, um, there's going to be a huge refactoring on all of like different reports people have made requests about. Or I know the auto report is one of them that they actually have said we're definitely going to get that fixed because it. It just needs to be enhanced. There's a lot of features on it. It's great. I mean, once you get it ran, it has everything on it, but it takes a long time. And there's not a feature like in Classic where you can find a particular employee or, you know, uh, just audit on a particular record. So I know they're going to be doing a lot of tweaking with the audit, with the reports. And I think auto report may be one of them. So everything looks good here. Everything looks Great, the way it's set up, my query looks good. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to save this auto report bundle. All right. So when I do that, I should be able to go out to the report bundle and see that that uh, that sitting out here. If I can find it, maybe it goes in alpha. It does. Okay. So now you can see my report bundle sitting there. But what I can do is there's this little timer button. It looks like a timer, it's a scheduler. So I can click on that and then I can actually set it up to be a report bundle that, that, that fires when the payroll is posted. Again, um, when you want to create a report bundle, we have a cron job op option for your, your job type option, an event, and that's what we're going to be doing because we're going to be setting it up to trigger when there's an event process or do you want to do it immediately? The job name already pulled in because I, it's called the audit. Now, the event, we have to choose what event we want to trigger this. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this drop down option. And when I do that, if I can find the, the payroll post, that's what I want to use. Mm, that'd be an alpha. Hold on. Payroll post event right here. So I'm going to click that event and then send the output file to. Because I'm wanting it to go to the archive file, what I could do or what I could have done, I could have actually just gone into the uh, the payroll, the per payroll uh, reports. Let me see if I can pull this down and it'll still let me do it. Probably won't but we'll try it. 
Let me just pull this over to my other screen. Uh, all right. So no, I can't. Let me let me just do this. We'll go back. We'll we'll digress, as we say. But we're going to go back here to the payroll posting report. If I view this, what I can do is the send to address is that payroll archive file. And all I need to do is I just need to copy this. I'll copy it here. Now, if I go back in to do to do the create again, probably should have done this first. But if I have a create, I'll hold it. What am I doing? I already have the report button created. Let me go back to the report one though. Jeez, I want to don't want to double my work here. Okay, so if I go back into the scheduler, <clears throat> excuse me, and if I pull up that scheduler, it's going to pull up again. I'm going to choose the event option. I'm not, I'm going to go back in and click my uh, post payroll event because that's what I want it to trigger when I post the payroll. There we go. And then because I copied that send output file too, I can just paste it in here. So now it knows, you know, put this out in the payroll archive file. In the, and then it actually process it with the day, you know, the processing of uh, the day and the month. And then the archive file type. <clears throat> I can choose a multiple notification, a single attachment, single notification with multiple attachments. I'm not even really sure if that's even valid with this, but we'll go ahead and choose it. And then when I click the save option, you'll be able to see now that my auto file is out there. So every, I'll go ahead and do a modify so we can actually look at it again. But every, every, time the payroll is posted, when I post it, that auto report is going to get triggered. It's going to run and then it will actually copy out to the payroll archive file, to the, the file. So you'll actually be able to see an auto report each time the payroll is, is processed. Um, again, we talked about report bundles. Same thing applies. We talked about it creating an archive, you know, a, a triggering event. We could also set up an event which is like a cron job. So basically, if I want a report, let's just say I want a report to process every Monday at uh, 12 o'clock in the morning. So every Monday, every morning, Monday at 12 o'clock in the morning, I could create that. And all I would have to do is click the create option. And in reality, I already did what I created one last night, but let's say we click the create option. I could call it whatever I want to call it, you know. Um, no, this is a good. I want to. I want to. I'm going to take it back. We're going to do a new one because this is just the one I want to do. I'm going to create one that creates a test uh, register every Monday at 12 o'clock in the morning. So I'm going to call it check register, and then. This is a check register. And I can put a tag. So I want to call it GR. And then I'm going to go ahead and select a report that I want to add to the bundle. Let's see. I think we have a check register. Outstanding check. That's what it's called. Let's do this. Let me call it outstanding check instead. All right, so I need again to actually put the plus button to get that to include in the report bundle. If for some reason I need to make any kind of a modification to this report, I could do that now by setting up the query option. If I wanted to put a start date and a stop date in, I could do that. Um, but the worst thing about that is I'd have to do that each time. If I'm setting it as a cron job, I basically am going to be um, setting it up. Maybe I want to process it um, 
Oh, I'm trying to think how I want to do this. Let's just do the month again. We'll just do the month because if we do the month and we save it, okay. So if I save it for the month, I could put that out there. So every time that report gets pulled, gets generated using a Prime Job Expression, it's going to actually include all the outstanding checks for the month, which is a good thing because every Monday we're getting this report, it's going to show us all outstanding checks for that particular month. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to save this. Yeah. Once I've done that, whoops, I'm going to go out of here, and then I'm going to set up my cron job expression so I can actually get it set up to process how I want it to process. So let me do that. Um, let's see. Okay. So we're going to go in again to the outstanding checks that I just created the bundle for. I'm going to click on that scheduler, basically. Scheduler tab or that little circle. And then what I'm going to do, I want it to be based on a cron job. And if you want to know um, different cron job like definitions, you can go off the internet. I actually think we might even have a link or something out there, documentation for that. But all the cron jobs have to be set up like with a definition. So, like, if I want to do it at 12 o'clock in the morning on every Monday for every month of the year. I need a cron expression set up. So like what I did last night, I went out, I just went out online and got the cron expression that needs to be used for that particular um, feature. You know, I want it at 12 o'clock noon every Monday for every day, for every month of the year. So I'm going to go in here and put in that cron expression. So this is the expression I need to basically tell me to trigger those reports at that particular time every month. And then who do I want to send these reports to? Um, the district, if they're running like certain reports, different reports, maybe not the, the outstanding payables, but maybe they have in their fiscal office, they have three different people and they want all three of them to be able to see the outstanding, uh, outstanding text reports. They could actually go in and put in all three of those email addresses. And then when this this act, when this report bundle actually fires, when it actually processes, it's going to send it to all three of those particular employees that they put in. So I'm just going to go ahead and put myself in. And then what I have to do is I have to tell us the archive type. So basically, do I want to send when I send the report, do I want to send it as a multiple notification with a single attachment or a single notification with multiple attachments? I think I'm just going to choose a single um, multiple notification with a thing or send multiple notation, notifications with a single attachment. So if I click save, I should actually be able to go out now to the job schedule and see but that is sitting out there to process. So let's go out to the job scheduler. We should be able to see it sitting out there. So it is. Here's my outstanding check. Who created it? What the status is? Then it's going to show me when the next run is going to be. That's 316, which is next Monday. At well, hold on here, Dennis next Monday at 12 o'clock in the morning. When it does that, uh, when it processes, it's going to show the last run over here at 316, and then it'll change this next run to be the next one. So that job is set up to just process every, all the time until you go in and tell it, I want to do this anymore, and, I, and click the delete button and get rid of it. Then it's not going to process anymore. So that's basically how you can set up the report bundle for the, uh, a report bundle if you want to have reports emailed to yourself or to others. And it's also the way that all of the file archives get the reports because those are already set up. And like I said, you could set up a report bundle to go out to the file archive if you choose to do so.
Our next option under reports is the canned reports. We're going to talk about the canned reports first. And basically what I'm meaning by canned reports is these are reports that are have all the definitions are already defined. They can't be changed. Nothing can be done to it. Um, and this is all, all different reports that basically are in classic right now that we process. Um, like your, let's do your, we did this yesterday, your SERS per pay report. It's just all the setup for those particular reports with the definitions already defined. And again, it's nothing that you can change. If something needs to be changed, that's something we have to ask our program. If SERS makes a change or SERS makes a change, yeah, we may need to change the setup on this report. But like ourselves, we can't go in and change anything. We can only input data that needs to go into the report as far as like the payroll, like this one, for example, the payroll date, the cycle, the beginning and ending dates, et cetera. But we cannot change anything the way that this report is set up. And that goes for all of the canned reports. All those canned reports are all the same. Nothing can be changed on the report. And you'll see, like I said, the canned reports, once you get in and start looking at them and using it, you kind of get familiar, like, what's a canned report? What's a template report? Those two kind of become more defined to you as you go on. Basically, a canned report is pretty much any report that's already like set in stone, you can't make changes to it. Nothing can be done different to it. So we have what we call template reports. The template reports can actually be found under, under the report manager option. So the template reports, those reports can be used. So like if you wanna just basically use what's sitting out there, like those can reports, you can do that simply by going in and just clicking on this, this little air down arrow, which is a generate button. So if I click generate, it's just gonna basically create the report, however that report is set up. Whatever is defined as far as properties, as far as query options, it's all gonna process like, you know, according, according to that. Now, the nice feature about template reports is you could actually take a template report and like tweak it to be your own. Maybe there's something on um, the birthday report. Let's just go look at the birthday report. Well, hold on. Finally, the account history report pulled up. You can see when I click generate, it does pull up the, um, the generate report option, which allows me to go into change the report name. I could go in and set up the query for the date you know, beginning date, ending date, and the sorting options, I could do that as well. And then I could generate the report. But again, I'm generating it based on what's already set up on that report, on that template report. But if I wanted to, like I said, let's say I wanted to tweak this birthday report. Uh, I, I, I generated it, I ran it, and I'm looking at it, I'm like, eh, there's a couple things on there I don't want and a couple things that I do want on it. So I could go in and tweak that and make it my own report if I wanted to. So maybe I like the, maybe I don't want the building correct, just for sake. I don't want that on there. So I'm gonna take it and just remove it by clicking that X over in the, to the right. So basically now I just have the employee number, their last name, first name, and birthday. Well, I really don't care about their employee number either. You know, so I'm just going to go ahead and about the last name, first name, and the birthday. Um, but maybe, maybe I do want the building code because that way uh, I could send this to all the different buildings. You know, here's the list of your employee birthdays, whatever. So then I could go into the configuration filter option and the building code, I can actually leave that the way it is. Maybe I want to have that query app to come up and make me define a, a specific building code. I could run that report several times. Maybe you have three buildings. Well, maybe you want to run a, the report to the three, four different buildings. I can do that. Um, I have the birthday. I want to pull the birthday, anything between uh, 
the beginning start date that I put in and the ending start date that I put in. If I don't want that query option, I could just get rid of it. I can just exit off of that. And then once I've done that, now that it's my own, I could actually go out and generate the report first. So I could look at it and say, yeah, I kind of like that or I don't. Again, I have the capability of changing the format. Uh, I can change the orientation. I can change the name if I want to. I can make a summary or a detail or a show report option, which is like this, the, this page set up as the report option. Um, if I wanted to do the query options, I go in and set the, uh, put in the specific building code. Remember, I got rid of those certain stop dates, so it's going to give me pretty much every birthday, unless I define the certain stop dates for birthdays. And then I could set up my sorting options. How do I want this to sort? Uh, actually, I wanted to sort by last name first. So I'm going to click last name. And move it over to the selected properties. And then we'll sort it by birthday. And we'll pull that over. Actually, no. Let's do this. Let's get rid of him. Let's put him back over here a minute. Let's move birthday to the top. Let me get rid of last name, put him back over. So I guess if that's unfortunate, you have to move it back over to the sortable properties and then move it over in the sorting order you want. It'd be nice if you could just click drop it and drag it, but you can't. So right now I have it set up as the birthday and then the last name. That's the sorting order I want. So at this point, I could go ahead and I could click this generate report option. Now, you see these arrows here at the bottom? I could actually click on those arrows and you'll see, come on, oh, hold on. It's supposed to be moving. Anyway, we'll go to the generate report. We're going to click, click, click on the generate report option. <clears throat> and when I do that, it's just give me a list of birthdays. I didn't put a building code in because I'm not sure what the building codes are in this test database. So again, since there's nothing defined, it may take a few minutes for the report to process. But the nice thing is, if I go out and I view this report and I like it, I could actually go out and I could actually rename this. So right now it's called SSDC birthday report. I could rename it and call it the building birthday report. And what I do is I say building birthday report, I click the save report option, and when I do that, it tells you that it saved the birthday and building report. So the features or the options that I put in that report are now saved. So when I go back out to the reports option, to the temple report, we'll just go back out here. So like I said, that may take forever for it to process because I didn't have a building code defined. You can see that that temple report that I called my own, I created my own is now out here under the template report. So that is a nice feature. Now, the nice thing about this is also, since I created this report, if I wanted to share this report with um, other people in my district, let's just say that they have uh, certain rules. I could go in and click this little, this button here, I don't even know what you call it. It looks like a lion. I'll call it the lion button. But you click on that, you could share this report with people that have whatever role you define. So maybe anybody that has a group manager or the standard user. And when you save it, it actually will allow those people now to be able to see that building uh, birthday report out in their template report output. We have another feature. Um, which is the download report option. So maybe you think this is just the coolest report ever. Our district says, oh my gosh, this is so great. I want to share it with my neighboring district, my neighboring payroll person. They can do that. All they would have to do is click the download report definition. And when they do that, 
They save that file to wherever they want to on their desktop or whatever. And then once they've saved it, they can actually go out and send an email to that neighboring payroll person and put that that um, JSON file because it, it, it's processed as a JSON file. They could take that JSON file, attach it to the email they're sending to their friend at the other district. Then when their friend at the other district gets it, they all they need to do is go under the report, uh, report manager option and click on this import report option because they've opened the report, they've saved it on their desktop or wherever. They can actually then pull that JSON file in and they will actually see that report out in their template report app. And if they wanted to, they could rename that file, whatever they want to, simply by just going into the modify feature. And then they could just call it, you know, maybe it says building birthday report when they imported it, but maybe they want to call it um, their own name, you know, whatever they want to call it and save that. Then that's going to be their template report out there that they actually pulled in from another district, they imported that in. So that's a really, really nice feature that they can do. Um, another thing that you can do, and we talked about, I kind of told you yesterday, I was gonna show you how to do this, but um, we somebody had asked, I think earlier, about creating um, custom direct deposit file, form file, and again, that is more uh, something that's more complex. That would be under our intermediate training. But I will show you, like, if you had that form file, like how you would get it into the system so you, it's actually usable. And this will just take a minute. All, that, all you need to do is when you're in the report manager, you just hit the create form option. And when you hit that create form option, it's going to ask you for a report name. So I'm just going to put direct deposit custom one and then we'll just put direct deposit db for the description and db for the tag now the entity tag when you're pulling in a, a custom direct deposit form file that you've created you have to choose the entity type the entity type is going to be called it's under payroll where are you oh hold on i get going too quick and then it doesn't matter. Here we go. Payroll detail, detail payroll direct deposit. Make sure I got the right place. Yeah, I do. So I'm going to click on that. And then from here, I can select my form file. So like I said, in our in our intermediate training, we'll talk about creating a custom form file, saving it, and then you truly could import that in that file just by going out to wherever you have it located. Um, let me just see, I've got some custom ones already created. I'll just use this one. Okay, then all I have to do is save that. When I save it, it actually puts it out on the reports menu, even though I'm probably never going to be, I'm never really gonna to be touching and I'm not doing anything with it but it actually then allows me to go in and define that format once i'm going into the payroll direct deposit to process a payroll direct deposit so like if i go into the payroll processing if i go to a posted payroll remember yesterday how i showed you the direct deposit option and all we had was the default form file option um let me just go into yesterday's Okay, let me click on the email notices. And when I do that, it pops up again, it pulls all those up. But that direct deposit form file that, file that I added should be out here, and it is. It should be available for me to use that, to actually use that form file that's going to be sending all of these direct deposit notices to the employees. So that's a really nice feature. And again, if somebody wants to know more about it before we have an intermediate training, which may be a month or two months down the road, um, let us know. We can send you some information 
kind of help you get that set up. And then our last thing under the reports option is the custom report creator. And the custom report creator allows you to create your own report. So you could go out to the select object option. And let's just say you wanted to create a report maybe uh, with employee information. So let's just go down here. Uh, I always go too far. I get scroll happy here. Okay, so here's my employee. I want to use the employee object to pull in data properties that I want to be on my report. So right now, if I look at this, um, there's a, you can see, well, this is kind of strange, but you can notice here these little arrows. Those will expand, and you'll see a lot more uh, objects available under each property. So if I go ahead and I click those, those look, the arrows next to them, because the first thing I want on this report is my employee's name. Well, the employee name is going to be obviously under the name property. So all I need to do to pull the, the employee name into my report property is double click on it. And I didn't. There we go. Or I can drop and drag. So I'll take class name and just drag it and drop it over here. So you got two options. Double click it, drop and drag, or drag and drop, I should say. And then maybe I want their address. So let me go back up because I think address is up here. And so I want the street one and three two. I want their city, their state, and their postal code, which is the zip code. Okay. So um, if I do that, I could go in, I could configure this. Maybe I'm, I'm trying to run a report and I only want um, Anybody that has a postal code of 4522248, I think that is, I don't know. Again, I don't know what these files contain. So let's just do this. Postal code, I could do is equal to or not equal to. I'll do not equal to because that way we should get something on the report then. Okay? And then um, if I want to generate the report to see it, how it looks first, I can. Or if I just want to save this report because I'm like, I know this is what I want my report to look like. I could do employee. I could name my report employee address, address if I could type. And I'm going to go ahead and I got to make sure I click the save report option. When I do that, again, it tells me that it saved that report. But now I can go in and generate the report. And because I had a query set up with, with, that was already defined, I didn't have a parameter that has to be entered in, you know, like a particular zip code. I could have done that by setting up parameters if I wanted to, and then they could actually type in a particular zip code. But I just defined basically not equal to this zip code. So I'm going to go ahead and um, generate my report. And when I do that, it should actually give me everyone in my system, all my employees that don't have that zip code of 43555. Here's this report that I finally finished. See if there's anything on it. Yeah, here's our birthday report um, that we were looking at. Four. Finally got it. But again, we sorted it by birthday. And what I could have done is I could have probably maybe um, entered in a start date and stop date because some of these, maybe they're not even active anymore. There's a lot of things that you can do to tweak your configurations, your query options. You can do all of that. Um, looks like this report process fairly quickly. Hopefully there's something on it. That would always, yeah, there is. Okay, good. I always get excited when that happens. Um, here's my report with the employee's first name, last name, street, city, state, and then anybody that, that doesn't have that zip code for 3555. That's my, my list of all my employees. So that's how you can create a custom report. And as you go along, the reports will get better. I mean, I think everybody says initially that's probably one of the hardest 
things when you're starting out are the reports. And um, we do have a lot of like experienced ICC people that have actually gone out and they've sent reports to uh, D. Kramer, who is a UAC, we, we call it UAC, it's a util, util, utilization advisory um, committee, basically. And what they're doing, we have three retired treasurers, and they're going out and they're testing a lot of the stuff that the programmers do because we still have time right now to do that. And they also go out, D has a report um, meeting like once a month or whatever, but she actually has what we call a library where we have like reports that, that have gotten created that others can use. And like I said, a lot of our experienced ITC people have gone out and given D some reports and she, they actually put them out there. So if you want to tell your district that, hey, these are, reports are available, you can do that. All you need to do is go to this, the help button that's out there on the screen. And we have this public care reports library. And if you click on that, it's actually going to show you all kinds of reports that we currently have out there right now. And they have them kind of set up on the events, like a per, like per pay report. And you can see here, they have like the description of the report, like what it's gonna be. And then if you wanna see what the report's really gonna look like, you can click, click on the click here option. I'll give you an example of the report. If you wanna actually pull that report in, make it your own. So like if a district goes out and they say, well, I really like this pay check number by payroll chat report, they could actually go in and they could take that JSON file and they can download it. They could download that to their desktop or wherever. And then, like I showed you earlier on that report banner, they could actually import that report right in so that they have the capability of using that report. So that's a super nice feature as well. Um, does anybody have any questions as far as the reports go? I know we went over, I apologize for that, but we had so much information packed into this last day that it's hard to get all and plus me being that I had to start probably three three screens re redo them because of my reporting issue. Um I appreciate everybody bearing with us and um if there's any questions, let me know. We are going to get you the CEUs form sent out as soon as we can. And again, we recorded all three of these sessions the first one, second, and third one. So they will be out there reviewing as soon as we get them updated and get that put out on the, on the web page. Um, another thing too, real quick that I'll show you in case you are a newer user, uh, we, were, we were referring to the documentation a lot when we were talking about things. Um, we have documentation out on the wiki. So if you go out, um, we have a, the Nawaka homepage. I, that's where I always go. You may have a homepage at your own ITC that has the SSDT wiki page already there. <clears throat> but with that being said, on that page, we have a lot of documentation as far as like technical documentation. We have the old uh, classic documentation. We have the USPS web documentation. And then we also have the new redesign documentation, which is right out here under USPS our documentation. And again, that has pretty much everything that you see in the USPR, USPSR screens right now. Um, as far as like trying to keep it up to date, we do that as, as often as we can. Every time something gets released or corrected, we're trying to get it uh, corrected, corrected. I can't even say my words anymore. We try to get it corrected and have that as updated as possible. Um, one thing I talked about earlier was those date shortcuts. This is where those are located, right here under the navigation. It, we have a date shortcuts option, and this talks about all the different shortcuts you can use. Like, like I said, we have the year, the fiscal year, the month. That gives you those shortcuts that you can use for your starting and ending dates. Um, another thing I wanted to show you as well, really quickly, I'm gonna try to get this done by 1230. Out in our documentation, we have this appendix out there, and the appendix actually has um, some example checklists that are sitting out there. 
we can, you can go and look at look at those as far as like um, special pay processing, quarter end checklist. Those are all sitting out there. You can use those as templates to maybe uh, enhance or you could get rid of some things if you wanted to. We have a general procedures page under the appendix, which is basically the basics. How to add an employee, how to process mass change, how to re uh, create a report from the grid, reporting taxable amount, taxable amount, things like that, just general uh, subjects. The migration process as far as like what they what you need to actually have set up before the migration, what districts can actually do to clean up their data, get everything ready before you they you migrate their data in. And then we also have the post import procedure that they need to that you need to process after the data is in, as far as like different reports that maybe you're going to run and compare totals and balances to. We have all of that out there. Again, you at the ICC can take this, you can use it, you can tweak it, you can add things to it, take things away from it. These are just like basic starting points <laughs> that you can use. We have a, a USPS, our common import error report or uh, chapter which gives you common importing errors and maybe warnings and how to correct them, what you can do to fix them. And then we also have uh, a frequently asked question. Oh, hold it, it's not there. Never mind, that's what's big on its own. We have an import fails with column count mismatch error. So again, you can pull that up and it gives you the problem and then basically the solution to that problem. Then we also have we go back, the appendix. Uh, we have a useful, useful procedures uh, chapter. And again, that's where our frequently asked questions is located. We have uh, the create the created customized email notification form. So people that were asking about that, they may be able to go out here and use this. Uh, just look at it, see if it helps you at all. Uh, creating and utilizing a template uh, record. Uh, uh, refunding a payroll item kind of gives you the steps on that. Uh, the payroll balancing issues. Uh, the USP has our documents. We have a bunch of different documents out there for the redesign. I'll just kind of click on that and show you what's available. Actually, we don't have a lot. We just have that deceased employee final payment document out there right now. And then we also have a manual check. So how to create manual tech, like Andrea talked about earlier today, this kind of breaks it all down for you. So um, I think that's all I have. Are there any questions at all? Just want to make sure no one has any questions before we ring it off here. And again, I appreciate everyone's patience and attentiveness to our sessions. We hope that um, this has been beneficial to you. And have a, have a great rest of the week. Tomorrow's Friday, so um, enjoy your weekend as well. And we'll talk to you really soon. Thank you.